and based with Gis Malawi as the DHS2 implementation lead. And over the next couple of slides, I will be taking you through the Malawi case study of the open LMIS and DHS2 integration. So when the MOHP embarked on the project for integrating the supply chain system and the DHS2, uh, the main concept was trying to ensure that these two systems are interoperable. Uh, prior to the inception of this project, the HMIS, uh, which is operating on a DHS2 platform, uh, was a standalone system. And also the supply chain system, which is operating on a open LMIS platform is also a standalone system. Um, during the inception phase, uh, I think a discussion in initially took place and trying to determine whether to directly integrate the two systems or to use an interoperability platform. And I think the preference at the time was to use uh, the interoperability platform as a policy uh, directive, so to say. So the main objective was to enable the integration and interchange of the supply chain data with the HMIS data and to develop a customized indicator and dashboard for the HIV, TB, malaria, and RHD programs. Additionally, uh, we wanted to build the capacity of the DHS2 and the LMIS team to be able to use the dashboards at various levels of the healthcare system and to make sure that uh, whatever decisions are being made on the ground are informed uh, by the outputs from this work. So for Malawi, the key stakeholders, there were quite a number of stakeholders. Um, the MOH was the project owner and the coordination unit was the central monitoring and evaluation division. So we also had to interact a lot with the HTSS department, which is responsible for managing the logistics data. And of course, the University of Oslo through his Malawi uh, were primarily responsible for facilitating and providing the technical requirements on the DHS2 end. And then the PSM was responsible for facilitating and supporting the technical requirements on the open LMIS end. And then we also had the Kunika Data for Action, which is a Bill and Melinda Gates uh, project, which facilitated the interoperability of the two systems uh, through developing uh, what we call the interoperability layer or, or an automated data exchange platform. So this was supported by the Global Fund. Quite a number of activities were undertaken in the process of integrating the two systems. This kicked off in 2018 October with a readiness assessment where all the stakeholders seemed to agree that probably wouldn't have been ready to start implementation until January. And then once the implementation kicked off, there was a stakeholder meeting that took place in March. And one of the outputs from that discussion was to make sure that we develop standard key performance indicators across the various programs that uh, we're interested in implementing. And then beyond that, a process was undertaken to make sure that whatever indicators we had identified were mapped uh, and documented accordingly. So whatever was coming from the other system uh, had to be mapped as well as what was within DHIS2. And then of course, the process of developing the interoperability layer and the master facility registry, and just making sure that we have the automatic automated data exchange platform uh, started around June 2019 and was running concurrently with the other project activities. So we had another follow-up meeting to review the indicators and then we came up with a final list of indicators by September 2019. And then we, because of the nature of the LMIS indicators, we needed to use um, predictors, which were only available for version 2.32. So we did undertake a process of upgrading our test instance uh, to version 2.32, and then went, went to the process of documenting and whilst this was happening on the other end, on the open LMIS end, there was a development 
process uh, on their API just to make sure that it's compliant with the data exchange platform. And then we started the user acceptance testing for integration in October uh, 2019. And then we proceeded to finalize the configuration of the indicators that were dependent on the upgrade, primarily the ones that uh, were relying on the predictors function. And then we considered the integration fully complete in December 2019 when we were successfully able to push data from the open LMIS into uh, the DHS2. So some processes were undertaken to develop some change management procedures and then migration of test, uh, migration of the LMIS data to the test instance. We had the dashboards configured and then we developed some training materials for an in-country TOT which took place in March, and that we also proceeded to upgrade our production instance and have been replicating the work there. And the final process, which was supposed to be undertaken for this was of course having the LMIS Academy, as well as making sure that we are having uh, district level trainings. Um, for now, the district level trainings have been uh, postponed because of the season that we're in. And just to provide a bit of a background on the DHS2 setup for Malawi. So it is the main data collection and aggregation platform, but we do have other systems on the HIS landscape, such as the IRIS, the LMIS, and various EMRs. So data is mainly collected through paper-based methods at the facility level. And this only becomes electronic um, at the district level. So we do have the DHIS2 mobile, which is rolled out in 13 districts. And basically these are the districts that have a lot of hard to reach uh, facilities. So we did migrate from the DHIS1 to the web-based DHIS2 in 2020. And this DHIS2 server is hosted by the Ministry of Health. And of course, various partners provide support uh, around the DHIS2 work, including his Malawi and the Kuniga Data for Action. And as mentioned earlier, we are currently running on a DHS2 version 2.32. So in terms of the information flow, uh, we do have five organization unit levels in DHS2 and this sort of replicates the MOH hierarchy. So at the lowest levels, we have the community level, which is uh, mainly represented by the HSAs and the senior HSAs in the information flow. So they collect the information at that level and then they push it forward to the facility level where they are interacting with uh, statistical clerks as well as various health workers. And then as we move uh, towards the district level, we'll find that there are more players at that level. We have the HMIS officials primarily responsible for entering the data into DHS2 where it's now becoming electronic and we've got various uh, program coordinators as well as the district health management team. So above that we have the zone level where we have the zone health officer as well as the zone of M and E officers. And of course at national level we have the program managers, uh, senior management within the Ministry of Health, various directors and various officers uh, within the ministry. In terms of the programs that are currently reporting in DHS2, I think we, we have uh, good coverage. We have the child health data, reproductive health, the IDSARA, the HIV and AIDS, although there's also a parallel platform that is running in country. We have the TB data, malaria, nutrition, non-communicable diseases, uh, health education services. And now we do have the logistics data and also we have the population data. So also to provide uh, a background on the open LMIS and how it's operating in Malawi, um, as you're all aware, it's an open source platform and it's mainly used for the electronic logistics management information system. So for Malawi, this replaced the supply chain manager software, uh, which had been operating for 13 years. And in August, 2017, we went live on the open LMIS and it is currently rolled out in all of the 29 districts uh, across 160 facilities, which are data capture sites. 
So the paper forms are available across over 700 facilities. However, we have 160 data capture sites for the open LMIS. So it's web-based, which means it's accessible anytime and anywhere. And it's mainly used to provide order information that is evidence-based and also to ensure that these are managed uh, effectively. So the data that is currently being collected in the open LMIS includes the closing balance, which is also the stock on hand. And this is collected um, on the last day of the reporting preparation. And then they're also collecting uh, the losses uh, damaged products uh, or products that were discarded. And then we have the negative adjustment, which in most cases uh, represents uh, products that might have been sent to another facility or maybe products uh, that were returned. So we also have the positive adjustment, which in most cases uh, might represent uh, the facility that was receiving stock from another facility, uh, or perhaps maybe an order request within the facility uh, that was supposed to have been dispatched but was not collected. Then we also have the quantity used, which represents the dispensation, what was actually given to uh, treatments. And then we have the stockout days, and then we have the quantity received, which are the commodities that are coming in from the Central Medical Stores Trust, or uh, there might have been an intervention or a partner decided to donate some products to the facility. So we can see what the LMIS reporting form looks like. And for every product, we have all of these uh, data variables or data elements which are collected for the form. In terms of the process uh, that the LMI system follows, so basically the facilities will be responsible for generating the paper forms. And then the paper form is sent to the district or to another facility uh, that then captures the LMIS reporting form into open LMIS. And then we have a district level, the authorization process for the LMIS forms. And in most cases, it is the pharmacy manager who authorizes this. And then this information goes through what we call the drug and therapeutic committee, which is chaired by the district medical officer. And basically, they, it's a committee that discusses issues concerning the district's uh, uh, ordering, how they're ordering their commodities, as well as other issues related to commodities. And after it undergoes the scrutiny of this committee, uh, it then goes to the DHOs where it is approved. And then this goes to the Central Medical Stores Trust. So at the Central, Central Medical Stores Trust, they do extract this data from Open LMIS and it's processed. And then a dispatch of the commodities takes place uh, going to the facilities where the facility now receives the orders. So just to highlight that the Open LMIS and Central Medical Stores Trust are not integrated at the moment. And that is why they have to extract the orders uh, from the Open LMIS and then process them outside the system. And then moving on to the architecture that facilitated the integration of the to system. What we're looking at now is a diagram that depicts uh, the processes that are required or the key elements or key components for the interoperability architecture. So the key components include the facility registry, which provides information about uh, where the data will be going to. If we're talking DHS toad terms, then we could say that this is the where variable. And what happens there is that the mapping for the various organization units uh, between the source system and the DHS2 has been outlined at the facility registry. And then we also have uh, another key component, which is the product category. And then, or, or you can call this a product catalog. 
And this provides uh, the information about the different products uh, and how they are mapped uh, between the two systems. So if we talk about this in DHIS2 terms as well, we could say this is the what uh, variable. And then we have the interoperability layer itself, uh, which is basically a mediator between the two systems and is coordinating uh, what is going on between the two registers and making sure that the information that is coming through is in a format that is acceptable for the DHIS2. And then of course we have the DHIS2 system, which is the final destination for all of this information. So the interoper interoperability layer is built on an open health information mediator platform. And it's basically a middleware system that makes sure that different health information systems are able to talk to each other and exchange information. It's open source and it's configurable to a, a specific use case. Basically the source system is required to be compliant to the platform in order to interact with the interoperability layer. And then just trying to understand um, what is going on on the interoperability layer. As I mentioned earlier, it's built on the open HIM architecture and we have the open HIE component, uh, which consists of business domain services and registry services, such as the terminology services layer, the client registry, and of interest to us in this case is the facility registry and the product registry. So the interoperability service layer manages the authentication process that takes place between the two systems, the entity mapping, and then just making sure that it's routing the request to the target system. And of course, an audit trail is uh, available uh, detailing whether the transactions were successful or whether those transactions failed and, and need to be rerun. So the first step in the process is trying to make sure that on the DHS2 front, we have created a client that would be used for the interoperability or the data exchange platform. And then we have also uh, created uh, the data elements for the open LMI system. And then this, the access to the API for fetching and posting data basically happens through the profiles. And then as I mentioned earlier, authentication of transactions uh, is taking place uh, on the interoperability layer, the routing of requests, uh, the error log, as well as the failed request rerun. But we also have to make sure that we have uh, user profiles for the users on the external system. And this is what was used to push the data into the interoperability layer. So on the other side, we also have a system administrator who is in the meantime checking and monitoring the transactions to see what has successfully gone through or failed uh, to determine if there are any other interventions that need to happen. And then at the end of the day, we expect that the information that has been pushed through the interoperability layer should be uh, visible within the DHIS2. So for the indicators, I am going to focus on the malaria program. We did develop indicators for malaria, TB, HIV, uh, as well as the reproductive health department. But for this demonstration, I'm going to focus on the malaria indicators. So you notice that uh, on this slide, we have um, some indicators that are highlighted in gray. And these are mainly the indicators that were created using predictors, whilst the other indicators that are not highlighted in gray represent the indicators that were configured using the DHS2 indicator app. So I'll just go over the list and uh, how this was calculated. Uh, we, we had the consumption to issuance ratio, which was basically uh, checking the quantity that is dispensed at the pharmacy against the quantity that is leaving, uh, the, the quantity that is dispensed at the dis dispensary against the quantity that is leaving the pharmacy for the dispensary. And then we have the caseload to consumption ratio, which is basically checking the malaria cases against the quantity that has been dispensed at the dispensary, the treatments that have gone to the clients. We also had an indicator which was comparing uh, the malaria cases against uh, the quantity of the commodities that were actually leaving the pharmacy. 
or the dispenser. And then we had the case law to stock on hand ratio, which was comparing the malaria cases that we have against the stock on hand, just trying to see if we are able to cover all the cases that we're having. Then we also have the average monthly consumption, which was checking the average quantity used for the last three months. And this is an indicator that was configured uh, using predictors. Then we have the month of stock indicator, which basically checks the stock on hand against the average monthly consumption to determine uh, how many months or how long the stock that we have will take us through. And then we had the stock available, which was just checking if the stock on hand is greater than zero. And then also the, whether the facilities were adequately stocked. And this was basically checking whether the month of stock is uh, greater or equal to one or uh, less than three. So these thresholds are defined by the various programs and this differs from, so the thresholds for malaria are different from the thresholds for TB and HIV. Then we're also checking whether there were other health facilities that were overstocked, which is basically looking at uh, the month of stock where it is greater than three months. And then checking also if we had facilities that were understocked, which is basically doing a count of facilities um, that had their month of stock uh, being equal to or less than one month. So in short, these are the indicators that we configured for the malaria program for the lab commodities. And as a country, we have four disaggregations for lab, which meant for each of those disaggregations, we, we, we had to come up with indicators, uh, this list of indicators. So as in the configuration process, just to highlight that um, the average monthly consumption is what is configured first when you're coming up with the predictors. And then the output from the average monthly consumption then becomes your denominator for your month of stock calculation, and then also can be used for your stock status indicators. So going over the list again, uh, just an extension of the previous slide, we also had indicators that were checking the cases that were tested using MRDTs um, against the MRDTs that were actually used uh, from the pharmacy. And we're also checking the months of stock for the MRDD test kits and then looking at availability, uh, adequately stocked, uh, facilities that were overstocked, and then also facilities uh, that were understocked. And again, facility, uh, and the indicators that are highlighted in gray represent uh, those that were configured using predictors. So after uh, defining our indicators, we did then configure them within DHS2, and this is just one of the dashboards on the stock status. And we can see that uh, using this visuals, we're going to see later, we're going to appreciate later when I go into the system, I'm going to show you uh, what this dashboard looks like and just try to zoom into the individual dashboard items so we can understand. But the most interesting thing is that we're able to make sure that um, our dashboards are able to guide the users and it's easy to use the outputs by making sure that we provide instructions for the dashboards. So we did create uh, interpretations within the dashboards. And then one of the interesting outputs that we're able to see um, is a comparison of the different key ratios uh, that the malaria program was interested in looking at. So typically you'd expect um, all of the different items to be within the target line, which is uh, one, but you do find that a number of items such as issuers to consumptions are going over the target line. And this created room for interesting discussions to take place to try and understand uh, what is going on on the ground. Uh, why is it that in some facilities you will find that the caseload uh, against the consumption is one-to-one -one, and in other cases you will find that this is slightly below or uh, this is slightly above and what are the expectations for each of these different scenarios. And this is what allowed us to feed into our dashboard uh, interpretations as we had those discussions, we're trying to understand is it the practices on the ground? Are we taking uh, more commodities from the pharmacies and just holding them 
at the dispensary, uh, what exactly is going on? Are we reconciling uh, our reports well? So it, it created avenues for a lot of um, discussions to take place. And then we also had interesting outputs, uh, which we're also gonna see later. Um, this is one of the stock status uh, dashboard items where you are just trying to check uh, how many facilities were stocked out, how many were understocked, how many were adequately stocked, overstocked, and then we also have the outliers which uh, are going into the category of invalid. And another interesting output from the dashboard was just trying to understand which one out of uh, the different large dosages was uh, stocked out in a particular period, was mostly stocked out. So, for example, we can see here that the six by four uh, dosage or commodity is the one that was mostly stocked out, uh, representing 50 uh, facilities, and then that represents 27% for that particular district. And then just to go over some of the lessons that were learned in this process, I think we got to understand um, that there was some development work required for the source system, just to make sure that um, the system is compliant uh, to the data exchange platform, the interoperability layer. And the development process uh, might have taken a bit more time and it's something that needs to be considered well as you're planning on your project lifespan. So it might be possible to configure this in a short space of time. It might also be that this might take longer than anticipated. So we also learned um, that there is need for the master health facility registry, as well as the product registry to undergo regular maintenance and updates, because you, you do have situations where facilities are being opened maybe not regularly, but it does happen where a, facility, a new facility has been opened and maybe this has not reflected on the master health facility registry and you might come across a situation where as you're trying to push uh, the payloads, uh, you experience uh, some failed files because of that. And then again, also on the product uh, registry as well, just to make sure that in, we had an experience in some cases where the product codes changed or some products were discontinued and some of them had been mapped to the indicators. And so you'd notice on the outputs that you were now getting blanks and uh, just trying to investigate that you'd understand that, okay, some products had been changed or the codes had been changed, some had been discontinued. And so those updates also needed to be reflected uh, on the product registry. And then again, we also went through a situation where the open LMIS reporting form was updated. Um, and this also meant that the placeholders, the placeholder data elements within the DHIS2 also had to be updated accordingly. And then there were also uh, quite a number of indicators um, that were requiring data from other systems. Now by other systems, I mean, uh, I don't mean the open LMIS, but another separate standalone system. So what this meant was that that information had to somehow find its way within DHS2 for us to be able to uh, configure uh, this indicator. The typical example is the gene expert cartridge. And for the TB program, this is housed in a separate uh, system. And we had to undertake a process to get that information into the HMIS just so we're able to configure the indicators and have some outputs from there. And then we also noticed after we had configured the indicators and just trying to understand the outputs and make comparisons with uh, what's in the open LMIS that there was a slight um, variation between the open LMIS uh, month of stock and average monthly consumption and the DHS2 outputs for the month of stock and the average monthly consumption. And I think this was mainly something to do with the current month's data um, not being reflected within the DHS2. And then another thing that uh, we did learn in this process is that there are multiple 
scenarios, there are multiple explanations for why things are happening the way they are. For example, if you look at a consumption, caseload to consumption ratio, maybe going all the way to two, something that you expect to be one to one or maybe 1.2, but if it goes all the way to two, I mean, there are a lot of questions um, that a user is now faced with. Is there a drug pilferage? Are we just holding too much uh, stock at the dispensary that we haven't accounted for? Uh, what exactly is happening there? So we learned in this process that there, there are a lot of uh, explanations and some of the issues also boil down to the data collection processes on the ground and, and how we are consolidating our reporting tools. And now this uh, brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I'm now going to uh, stop sharing momentarily and maybe um, open the floor for some questions. And also maybe I would like to invite colleagues from Malawi who are present on the call, um, colleagues from the Ministry of Health or uh, from the USID PSM or uh, as well as from the Konika project in case there's anything they would like to highlight uh, or that I haven't uh, reflected accordingly. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Mongeni. Uh, excellent presentation. I'm so glad that we were recording that uh, so that we can continue to share that out and make it available presentation for everyone. Um, at this point, please do ask your questions in the Slack. If you are also coming from Malawi and you would like to share some insights or elaborate on something further, please also then you can raise your hand or um, can they raise their hand? Martin, how do we do this? If we want to unmute someone. Yeah, you can raise your hand. I might have a hard time. Martin, we can't hear, I can't hear you. You're too quiet. Uh, yes, it's possible to raise, uh, click on yes, no, uh, in, and raise a hand. It may be hard to see, but right now I'm using the like for that. I'm guessing that could be work. Uh, however, I might want to stop the recording before we do this part. So I'm going to stop the recording now.